Good afternoon, thank you for, for being here. Um, I, I assume that if you're here, that means you would like to hear about shared space. In the, in the interest of having a shared space, I would like to invite you. Thank you, sir, you got the idea right away. I'd like to invite you to move a little bit closer. Um, the, 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 the research on this shows very strongly that if you're physically closer, you actually hear more and remember more and ask better questions that you can be proud of when your friends watch it later on the internet. So I would invite you to move closer, please. It's nicer, it's nicer for everyone. My name is Timothy Snyder. I'm a historian. I have been parachuted in from a completely different part of the intellectual world to try to find a way to talk about shared space. It's, it's, um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with um, two representatives of the business world and two representatives of non-governmental organizations which have to do with human rights. The way we're going to proceed is that I'm going to introduce them very, very briefly. <laughs> I'm going to say a word about this shared space concept because like everything in WEF, shared space runs the risk of turning into a cliche before we even decide what it means. So um, our, my participants, my fellow participants are um, starting to my left, Dominic Barton, who is the chairman of Tech Resources in Canada and uh, for about a decade was global managing partner of McKinsey, also the chancellor of Waterloo, is that right? Very nice. And then to his left, we have um, Jean Burgo, who runs something called Internews, uh, an international group which is meant to support local journalists and young journalists. We're going to hear more about it. Uh, then we have Jean-Pascal Duvoiseau, um, Jean Pascal, or JP, Jean Pascal is more fun to say, who's a member of the board of PPF Group, uh, which, is, which invests all around the world, but with a special emphasis on, I think it's fair to say, on Eastern Europe. And then to our extreme, to our extreme right, we have, um, we have Debbie Stothard, who is one of the secretaries general of the International Federation for Human Rights. And it's the first time I've been described as extreme right. <laughs> Wait, I, I meant to say extreme. <laughs> um, but I think we're, I mean, the point is that we're all in the center. Okay, so which brings me to the idea of, of shared space. So that shared space is an idea, and it's an idea which, is just, which has been proposed um, by a couple of very interesting groups. Um, it's an idea which has been proposed and which we're now going to see if we can, we can try to make it makes sense. Um, the notion of, of shared space is that business and civil and civic rights organizations, business and non-governmental organizations, have something fundamental in common, um, that, that, that they together create a zone of the rule of law. And in different ways, they have an interest in the rule of law being preserved. So this, this comes from, this idea of shared space comes from a report called Shared Space Under Pressure, which was written by um, the, the Business and Human Rights, I'm gonna put my glasses on because I don't wanna improvise, uh, written by the Business and Human Rights Research Center and the International Service for Human Rights late last year. Last year was an interesting time for this notion because also a coalition of businesses late in 2018 uh, published an appeal supporting the idea of associating business with human rights. Also, some of you may have seen a poll published late last year which found that 76% of people asked thought that CEOs should take a lead on issues of human rights. Of course, what people mean by human rights, of course, could be different from, poll, from person to person. But it is an interesting moment where I think it's fair to say there's an acknowledgement on the one hand that business matters perhaps more in the world than it ever has, and on the other hand, that that involvement can go politically in, in different directions. So what is the idea of this shared space? I'm coming from Vienna. I'm sure you can hear the accent. And uh, in, in Vienna, in the 6th District, um, there's a street called Maya Hilfestrasse. And in Maya Hilfestrasse, there are buses, and there are walkers, and there are bikes, and there are a few cars. That is a shared space. Um, in the trivial city planning sense of shared space, but it's an interesting way to start because in this, in this shared space, when it used to have all cars, everyone said, you can't make it a shared space because if you have, if you, if you have the cars, you have commerce. But if you get rid of the cars, all the business will dry up. Now you know where the story's gonna go. Exactly the opposite happens, right? The moment it becomes a shared space, some of the businesses are annoyed, a few of the businesses close, but in general, the whole zone booms, and it booms in terms of prosperity, but also in terms of freedom, because if you're walking, you can get from place to place without getting into a car and having to park and so on, you're a little bit more free. So that's a shared space in city planning terms. Shared space in our context is this idea. It's, it's the idea that business depends upon the rule of law, 
and that the people who defend human rights are at the frontier of defending rule of law. So if you want to put the point in an extreme way, you could say, in some sense, business is actually free riding on other people who do the job of defending the rule of law. Business needs the rule of law, but it doesn't create the rule of law. People who are at the margin, who are at the frontier, who are taking risks, are the ones who actually defend the rule of law. And they're the ones who end up going, jail, going to jail for it, or losing their jobs, or sometimes being killed. So there's a notion that both sides, although they don't necessarily uh, see this, have this common interest. And that the interest in human rights organizations, of course, is to promote human rights. Human rights we take as a good, um, specifically assembly, expression, association, representation are, are featured in these reports. And that business also may have a collective interest in an environment which is predictable because of the rule of law. And that individual businesses may also have reputational interests in getting on, let's call it, the right side of, of certain kinds of issues. So this is what, this is what shared space is, is meant to mean. Um, and the, the, the notion is that there might be a conceptual conversation that could happen between the kinds of people we have gathered here where we can figure out what that space might mean in practice. The hope with these concepts is that they allow us to see things that we might do that we might not otherwise do and find partnerships that we might not otherwise find. So in, in that spirit, Gene, I'd like to, I'd like to begin with, with you. You've had a, you have a very you have a very specific engagement with a very specific group of what in this context are called human rights defenders, namely journalists. It's been a tough time for journalists in the last couple of years. A couple of thousand physical attacks, um, very often linked, by the way, to 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 business um, in the dozens of murders last year alone. So I'd like to ask you, does this framework of a notion of shared space make any sense to you? Does it inform or in any way describe your own engagement with the private sector? And more specifically, what can business do to help with free expression? Yeah, no, I like that we are, I think, uh, a critical piece, the freedom of expression is a critical piece of this shared space, no doubt. Uh, the reason we do this work is for people, citizens, to have informed choice so they can make good choices for their families. You can imagine that's what do they purchase? Where do they rent their houses? Where do they buy their, where do they send their kids to school? It makes sense because they, that helps them participate in their communities, run their own businesses. You need that free flow of information to, to run a good business. And then obviously it's to also hold your governments to account promises and, 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 and taxation and all the diff different public policy issues that are so important to business. I mean, the, 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 the shared space is so very, very, very obvious. Unfortunately, as you were saying, uh, that shared space is under incredible threat right now. Um, one in seven people, according to Freedom House, lives in a country deemed to have a free press. One in seven people. And the giant sort of challenges facing a free press, one of them, Tim has already described, is this sort of you know, very overt censorship, violence against journalists is on the rise. I mean, but even the overt censorship of governments being willing to just shut down the internet if they feel like it, which we never dreamed would happen. We thought the business argument would be so strong, you would never do that. Well, it's increasing every year, and governments are being very strategic about when they sh completely shut down the internet in parts of the world. So that censorship bucket is one big bucket. Uh, the second big bucket, one that's been talked about a lot here, is the chaos in the information landscape, the misinformation, disinformation, the uh, propaganda, all the hate speech um, in, in places where we work together. It's really polluting that healthy information ecosystem that we're, we're talking about that, that, that makes this, this shared space. Um, and you know, according to MIT, that uh, lies and disinformation travel 20 times faster than good real news. And so this is a, and it's causing a collapse in trust in the media. And so we're losing an incredibly valuable resource because of it. And on top of all of that, if that's not bad enough, the market is collapsing around the news business as well and has been for decades, but it is uh, dramatically increased in the last couple of years as digital ad dollars become more and more important and Google and Facebook are eating up all of those digital ad dollars. They're at 61% a couple of years ago, but they're taking 90% of all digital advertising, which is strangling the news business and, and particularly the local news business, which is, I think, where you feel it the most in your communities. And so that's a, particularly local news is very, very vulnerable. We at Internews are really basically trying to save local news. We just think it's just such a fundamental part of society. And it used to be that there were lots of pockets that were information deserts um, that we would go in and try to build a new healthy information ecosystem. Now we're finding those deserts emerging everywhere. And so our, our, the countries that we work in range from the United States uh, to, you know, uh, 
to South Sudan and sort of the varied sort of challenges that the information landscape is, is, is facing. Um, uh, so we provide training, we sort of uh, bring in new business models, we help news organizations try to grow and, and, and thrive ultimately. Um, the way, there's, there are really concrete ways um, that, that, that these free riders, you describe them as free riders? Because this thing, <laughs> these free riders can, can help, I'm helping when it comes to this. Um, one of them is that your advertising dollars really, really matter. And I won't get into the detail, it's, 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 it's technical if you're not in the business, but, but there's this thing called programmatic advertising, which means that many, 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 many businesses have given up directing their ad dollars and they just rely on algorithms for their ad dollars. Well, brands are getting really frustrated with that because your ad dollars go to awful places. And so we're working with, in, actually in a project with the WEF, to encourage brands, we're working with digital ad advertising firms, but encouraging brands, think about where your ad dollars, you can co take control, re-control of your ad dollars and actually put an infusion of resources into growing healthy uh, uh, local media markets. And so I would encourage all of you to, to think about that. Um, a second way is uh, for the platforms, if anyone here represents a platform, there's lots of conversations about their role in local media. The fundamental thing we need the platforms to do is to, to, to just commit to the importance in helping the news ecosystem. There, you know, I'm not going to say they need to be editors, and there's a whole lot of d debate about that. But if they just said this is a this is a value of ours, a lot of things would change on the platform, including sort of where the where the media shows up. Um, so those are two really, really, really critical pieces. A, a third and sort of less. No, I'll stop there. Actually, I'll come back to mine. Okay. I mean, in, in, in what you say, there's, there's an important example, actually, of the free rider problem, if we're going to stay in this <laughs> economics language, which is that there are only a few thousand investigative journalists in the world. So we all, we all talk about news and we all consume news, but m most of the news that we read, if it's actual news, is somebody plagiarizing an investigative reporter, right? And then most of the things that pass for news are not, in fact, news at all. So the entire internet is basically constructed as a kind of weird free rider on the work of basically a couple thousand people in the world. And we have a, I mean, I think it's fair to say that we, including business, have a collective interest in there being more investigative journalists and more journalists mm -hmm. generally. But that's not the way market forces themselves as, as structures are set up now are, are, are pushing us. And I mean, the second thing which is very important in what, in what, um, in what Jean is saying is that the research from, uh, from Russia to America shows again and again that the moment when local news goes away is the moment when the distrust starts. And it's very hard then to stop the cycle because when you lose the local news, people start talking about the media and begin to treat the media as something distant which is not about them. And once you lose it, getting it back then becomes a struggle which is why your work is, is so interesting. So um, Debbie, you've had some personal experiences in um, finding yourself uh, sharing space behind bars with people when you didn't expect to be um, in settings which um, which bring to light some of the dilemmas and some of the difficulties in, um, in, in establishing a shared space. I wonder if you could speak to the general issue of whether you think shared space makes sense in a human rights context. We're in the 70th anniversary of the UN Declaration on, on Human Rights um, a few months after it. And also if you could give me a sense of your own experience on the ground. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tim. I think um, firstly we, we have to recognize that if businesses can't run without information, we are living increasingly in a, a, a situation where you need access to information, especially in terms of identifying problems on the ground and responding before it gets out of control. And this is where communities from the ground, human rights defenders, civil society have a role to, pay, to play. And in some situations, it's seen, we seem to be the enemy instead of being a resource going, okay, this is a problem, we have to fix it before it gets out of control. And, and then situations are allowed to fester. And in many cases, um, businesses try to make, uh, try to strike a balance between doing business um, and not uh, doing business without um, falling afoul of the local regime. Um, but then trying to also find their own little bit of freedom to keep on doing their business, not realizing that they're actually perpetuating the problem. So when, when we're on the ground and um, we're being targeted by uh, government or local authorities who don't like what we do and see us as a threat, 
and um, companies politely ignore it and they do business as usual, they're basically condemning us to being subjected to even more crimes. Eventually, the situation grows and touches them and then they freak out. I'm going to tell you an example. 2014, at a plenary at the OECD Forum on Responsible Business Conduct, I'm sitting here like this in a room full of people from OECD, uh, business leaders from OECD mem member states, and I say to them, you all have the power to prevent a genocide in Burma. In Burma, Myanmar at that time, it was very clear that the situation of the Rohingya was fast deteriorating. And um, when I said that, you, all of you are investors. Myanmar, Burma is looking for investment. They're aggressively doing this. You need to speak up and say, for us to be able to do business here, you need to fix this problem. Of course, the response was blank faced and you're probably thinking, can she stop talking and we move on to the next topic? Well, three years later, there is a genocide. Um, and now the com companies are freaking out going, oh, we don't want to be implicated in genocide, so we're pulling out or we're not going in. It's a big missed opportunity. If, if, if business had intervened, and this is not um, a, a very small, teeny weeny problem, this is a significant, this is a crime against humanity. Uh, this is genocide. And, and I don't think any business person would say, I'm happy with a genocide or I'm willing to take the genocide. Of course not. But at that time, they didn't have the courage or the foresight to intervene. And now we've lost a huge opportunity. The lives lost, the fact that there's a million people now in Bangladesh in the world's largest refugee camp and some horrific atrocities. And people now, business community, feeling a little bit nervous about, about continuing or expanding their interests in Burma. And, and all they had to do was speak up. Similarly, in Bangladesh, where the internet was shut down and then slowed down during the elections, the, the garment industry is focused on health and safety around Rana Plaza, because that hit their reputation so bad. And now they've, they, and, and since then they've, they've, they've caught up trying to be very, very proactive on that. But do they, they've politely ignored the fact that enforced disappearances and other human rights violations affect their workers. There are huge numbers of garment, women garment workers who are safe in the factory but are not safe going and coming from work. So I think we, when we talk about this shared space, we all live in the same planet and we all, we all breathe the same air unless you have a spaceship I don't know about. So we, we do need to understand um, and just last week before, as I was packing to come here, they shut down the internet in Zimbabwe and went on a big crackdown, right? Uh, uh, JD was talking about journalists. In Burma now, we have two Reuters journalists, Walon and Chosso U. Chosso U is an ethnic Rakhine Buddhist, and they are in jail for seven years for having reported on an, a massacre of Rohingya people. And so we have this very terrible situation. In Zimbabwe, uh, friends were saying, we were told by businesses that to come to work, don't do anything political. But in the end, the violence on the streets was so bad that nobody could come to work. So I think we can't separate that. And we <coughs> need to actually have the foresight and the courage to understand when there's a fire burning, the first thing you need to do is help put it out. So uh, that, that there are a number of very interesting things here. I want to connect the Rohingya issue back to Jean's point because another thing which happened in that, in that case of genocide has to do with local media, not just people being locked up, but with the fact that the way that the, the, way that the news cycle locally worked involved social media platforms inflaming tensions and spreading hate speech in a pattern which we've seen in the United States, in Ukraine, and lots of other places around the world. And that's also, so it's a case where the presence of, of actual journalism is extremely important, but also where we might see an opportunity for a business to be thinking about information, which as, as you say, I think is part of something that we all, we all take for granted. Before I move to um, our colleagues from the business world, though, I wanted to appeal to the two of you to give me a positive example, right, it's perhaps of, of your cooperation in the, with the private sector, or is, of an example of where business did the right thing. Yeah, I'm trying to buy you some time there, JP. Well, yeah. 
I I mean, I'm really excited about a project that actually was birthed here in Davos uh, with with uh, with private industry, uh, coming as a, a civil society activist, really at some level, and meeting the folks you meet here. It's like the disconnect between the work that we do in places like Burma and what the global media industry was talking about just seemed extreme to me. And so we started exploring with them, like what can we do together to to solve some of the challenges? And that's where we birthed this thing called United for News. And what's really exciting, and where, where we're coming together to sort of say, what can we do? And that's where this sort of idea about let's let's break the the new advertising model and, and 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 get back to some first principles with our ad dollars the enthusiasm of some of the biggest brands in the world uh, to, to this idea is extraordinary and I, I in all honesty if it works which I hope it does it is going to change the, the landscape for so many media outlets around the world so we're really really excited about that one of the big companies said that media freedom of expression is the canary in the coal mine of human rights abuses if you see that's the first one to go and if you see it, everyone's in trouble. So I, I, I've, I've been wildly in, encouraged by the interest of, of the global, uh, global, global industry in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, that there was a very serious and extended problem of, uh, and could, which to a certain extent continues today, which is slavery on the fishing boats mm -hmm. that uh, entered into the supply chain of the seafood, in, uh, seafood retailing. And um, uh, people on the ground worked and tried to highlight this with the local companies and the local government, the national governments. And they were told this is too complicated, this is too complicated. When the, when the situation was reported globally, and this is why we need good media, um, retailers in the West um, um, actually canceled the orders because this is quite clearly a, a problem of slavery in the supply chain. And then there, there was, in Thailand, there was a whole um, response. All the, all the very many complicated issues suddenly became very simple. And um, um, they started a multi-stakeholder process to try and address and minimize and prevent slavery on the fishing boats. But I think the most exciting thing is the fact that we have um, uh, jewelers, um, clothing manufacturers and a number of other firms uh, in last December on the 70th anniversary of Universal Declaration of Human Rights saying that protection of human rights defenders is essential to businesses be, be staying profitable. I think that's, that's important and I, th I hope that more companies realize that we are not the enemy. So, so Dominic and JP, I'd be, I'd be interested to hear from both of you about, about the general idea because these ideas, like the idea of a shared space, they're only helpful if they get us to think about things in a different way. And they're only helpful if they're consonant with the possibility of new sorts of practices. I mean, in this report, they recommend things like human rights impact assessments, right, as part of a regular protocol. They recommend, um, as Debbie was just stressing, they recommend treating non-governmental organizations, including trade unions, which is important, as precisely an information system, which prevents this pattern of ignoring a local problem getting involved in it and then only pulling out when it reaches the, the, the global level. So I'd like, to ask, I'd like to ask both of you that question in a general way. Does this idea of a shared space make anything click? And can you imagine or do you, or do you, you yourselves in your own experience, have you carried out protocols of this kind or could you see a use for them? So I, I have to say first of all is uh, I agree with what you said, just with one thing, is human rights is not just essential for business to be profitable. I think human rights is just essential, point. Mm -hmm. So, because in the end, even as business leaders, as all of us in our position of responsibilities, you don't, you're not accountable for a p and you know, You're accountable for ethical principles, or how you behave, how you want to look at yourself. Um, so, uh, I feel th there was a lot of discussion around what we should do and we shouldn't do and how we deal with this. And yes, we're active in many geographies where um, it could be labeled as being difficult countries, not in the countries that you mentioned or you've mentioned, so thank God. Um, but maybe that how do we, you say that we have to take the lead. So what do we do very specifically at the very pedantic level? So first of all, there's no, it's around the ethical principle you want to, you want to follow, which business you go in because one thing is operating in a country that where you would have problem with human rights, but on total on products on services that are basically enhancing the, the rights, the life, the quality of life of your of your of your consumers, uh, of your employees. I mean, the way you treat your employees is extremely important. The way you treat your consumers is very important. And if you're not there to do it, 
since the needs are there, you're just going to be replaced by companies that may be significantly less ethical in the way they deal with that. And um, I know I look, I look at you and say, oh, Jesus, this is a bit corporate, blah, blah. But it is not. It is not to basically enhance, to have human rights, to have uh, trade unions, to have uh, employee representation in countries where it's not compulsory, where it's not obligatory, is a meaningful enhancement of human rights in that country. I, want you to, I need you to feel the friendly vibe now. <laughs> no, no. But so I think it's, it's, it's a very um, important thing that we, we personally take a lot of attention uh, about. Um, and then there's the question about abiding the law. Uh, it was just not using the law to do wrong things, but abiding the law. And I was at the breakfast on uh, LGTB rights uh, earlier in the, in the forum sessions, and we had a bit of a similar discussion because it's also a human right. And so you had uh, Michelle, who was there, and people from ENY, and said, so how do you do in countries where it's impossible to do? And the answer was very pragmatic. Uh, well, in Rome, behave like a Roman. Uh, you're not going to basically put employees at risk because you want to follow blanket policies, which are not applicable in the countries where you are. Um, there is a discussion about advertising space for media, and I want to take it head on because we are active in the telecom space, and by now telecom means internet, and internet means media, okay? We even used to own uh, TV in the Czech Republic in the uh, 90s, early 2000s. And there I have to say our policy has always been, and the one of the uh, key shareholder of the group, of neutrality. So we were pushing to have diversity of opinion represented on the uh, on, the, uh, on the, our TV media, on our platform, or our newspapers. And that was our contribution as business, to make sure you have diversity of, uh, of, op of opinion. We didn't want to basically take side on either left or right, which, by the way, also meant at times leaving people that would be labeled by free media as being populist, also the right to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a few things I wanted to put on the table. They maybe look a bit pragmatic to uh, more spirited people. I've never been in a position to prevent a, a massacre of, uh, in uh, Burma. We all you had to do was speak up. That's yeah, all. You didn't have to like, no, you know, not, be not, a no, no, superhero. I, I understand, but we're not even investing in the country. Okay. We don't even follow the country. So you take your bag and you go to Burma and say, don't do that. You know, like, what do you have as a reason of talking to them? So, so JP, I want to just push you a little bit. Hey, go. Um, so the question is, I mean, I, I see the justice in all that you say. And of course, the point that some of the basic things that people need for their own welfare and freedom can, only be, can, can be best provided by the best business in the time and place, very important. And in fact, it's a starting point for the whole discussion. The, the shared space idea, though, is, is proposing that a proactive engagement by business with non-governmental organizations might bring something that the business itself wouldn't come up with on its own, right? So you, you've, you've enunciated some principles which make a lot of sense. My question would be, do you think it's possible that if you, if you your company, some part of your company that doesn't presently exist, uh, reached out, there might, things might come back, right? So, I mean, the, you, the example of LGBT rights. In Hungary, which is regarded as a difficult country in many ways by some people, um, it, there, are, there, there is actually an NGO which works specifically on LGBT rights by avoiding the government entirely and by engaging only with business. But by engaging with business, the idea is that it creates norms which then spread out through society. Right? So that kind of thing can happen, and, and it actually does happen in the world in surprising places. But my question is, does this shared space idea make sense to you in the sense that you can imagine if I proactively engaged, I might hear things that might make me think of protocols that I wouldn't think of otherwise. It's true, and I would even tell you that business, because of its role in terms of employment, uh, because of its role in terms of tax-paying entities, has an ability to have dialogue with key politicians in a way which is significantly less threatening for uh, key politicians than an NGO would have than a, a large-scale large scale street mobilization would have. And that is something that well, we do, business does. It's, it's as they playing a role, not maybe at the forefront of the Gilets Jaunes in France or God knows what, but you have a meaningful dialogue there, which is influential, and where, where you can play a role 
in defending the shared space, in defending these uh, human rights in a, in, a, in a very pragmatic way. Because in the end, if you are a key part of a country economy in terms of provision of key services, employment, tax, um, you're part of the, of the ecosystem and there is no politician that wouldn't basically care for the, the, uh, the well-being of the, of the economic system. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, that is exactly the argument that a number of human rights defenders have been making, precisely that argument. So, so Dominic, same, same, same question. Um, does, I mean, looking forward to your new responsibilities and looking back to the, the, the previous very important responsibilities that you have had, does the idea make sense to you? And when you think of, say, some McKinsey invest, in, I'll leave it to you to choose which ones, at least for now, but when you think of some McKinsey engagements around the world, are, are, there, are there examples where you think, hmm, if we had reached out earlier to local knowledge or if we had paid more attention to journalism or whatever it might be, outcomes might have been different, we might have made different choices. Sure. Um, let me start first just on the, on the broader piece. I mean, I, I definitely agree with the shared space notion, and thank you for helping elucidate what it me means. But I think this notion of, you know, uh, multiple players and different sectors working together to make a system better is fundamentally important for everyone, uh, and, and everyone has to contribute. And I think that, if I might, this may seem like a bit of a digression, but I think for it. Capitalism over the last 30 years has become less inclusive. It's become uh, more short-term and uh, less owner-like. And, and I, so I think a lot of business leaders have were, were grown up in the school of the business of business is to make money. That's the Milton Friedman cry from 1970 that was uh, that look, look, people don't get distracted. And I think. That is not a sustainable system. And you see a ton of efforts going on, led by business, by investors. There's at least 15 different efforts that are out there that, you know, the social responsibility is actually fundamentally important. You need a social license to operate. And I think a lot of businesses have done that, uh, but a lot have not. And so I think there's a, there's a bit of a shift that's, that's going on. And that's, we have to recognize that there's a broader responsibility. I think we have to be careful about how much business can do, um, you know, in, in the system, what we're capable of doing and not capable of doing. Um, and I, but I think the, but the notion of different stakeholders working together is critical because we each learn from each other. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Joe Nye view that the best leaders are tri-sector leaders. They're leaders who actually have experience working in the private sector, public sector, and social sector. That's a, I, I wish I'd had more of that experience working in the, in the public sector and social sector, I think I'd be a better private sector leader. And I think the same goes in the other sectors because you understand more about what people can do. So long-winded way of saying, I think this is important. I think if you're a business that wants to be around for a while, you have to be thinking about your role in the society in which you're operating, right? And, that, and, and I think the pressures that are driving our, us, this now are you know, you are, are actually coming from the internal side as well. You have employees, like I noticed in my 10 years in McKinsey, I, I never got messages early on about a view, like why are we doing work here or what's a view happening here? That is fundamentally different to the point of saying, we think we should make a statement. It was kind of like, wow, that, you know, what, and, and that's a, so you have a, a more demanding, articulate, which I think is good, boisterous, internal group that is, that is actually putting a lot of things, which I think is a good thing, um, into, into the system. And I think the other thing is if you're not part of the community in which you're operating, like you're not actually thinking about the health of the system and how it works, short term you'll be fine, but long term you probably won't, won't be around. And again, the tricky thing is what is it that business can actually do or not do? I think there are natural, I think employment, education, that there's some, you know, health, the, the, some basic elements of human rights. If I, I was thinking about the LGBT, I remember mm -hmm. a case when I was, I was the office manager in Korea, uh, one of my, my colleagues came up to us and said, I have a partner, but under Korean law, I don't get, uh, I don't get, I don't get the same rights as a heterosexual couple. You know, what can we do? And my view is we, we're, we're McKinsey globally. We op I don't care what the laws are here. We're gonna, we are gonna fulfill that, uh, if you will. Now, I didn't take out advertising 
to say we did that. It was more, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. But I did mention it to the government, to the president. I mentioned it to them, saying this is, an, you, have, you have a very odd system. I'll just tell you that. And it, I don't, maybe we should have done more. I don't, I don't, but I'm just saying that there are things you, you, you at least can do for your employees and where they are. Now back to looking back at issues mm -hmm. we've, you know, there's many mistakes that, that we've made, that I've made um, in, in various different parts of the world. And I think that, I think that the, when we've made the mistakes, it's because we actually haven't been listening to the non-business world about the type of work. We weren't aware of some of the shifts that were going on or the perceptions of what was happening. We're just focused on doing our work. We want to have impact with the clients and, and where it is and how we drive it. And I think in some countries, which I would argue are, I, I, was, I should be careful I say it because I think some elements of this uh, attach to the United States today. Sure. So, okay, if I think about immigration and things like this. But, 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 but in, in, if, in countries where they're more emerging in the system, the rule of law may not be there, I think it's essential to have a network of people, including journalists, including academic uh, people who can be kind of a sounding board about the type of work that you should do and not do, um, the perception that you have uh, in, in the community. And I think where we've got ourselves into trouble is we haven't had that uh, group, uh, if you will, but where we've worked in some, in some very volatile places, Pakistan, uh, for example, we are, we're very close with the NGO community. We treat, they're, they're actually allies, if you will, to give us information about what we're doing and not doing and where we should work and are these the right people to work with and, and all of that. Is that so? So I, 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 we make mistakes. I think the thing is, how do we, how do we learn uh, from that? How do we think about improving our processes? Um, but, but, we, but the bottom line is, I think, if you're not, if you as an organization are not part of your local community, I don't think you're going to be sustainable uh, uh, over time. And, that, and for a global firm, that's becoming more challenging in a more nationalistic world. We work in Russia, and I'm very proud of the work we do in Russia. We work in China, we work in the United States. There's some people that would argue we shouldn't be working, you know, and we're a, cool. so th this is where you also get into some other debates and, and so forth. Anyhow, I'm blathering here, so I'll shut up. No, 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 <laughs> uh, thank you. That's, a, that's an extremely Im Im interesting and important statement. I wanna, I, I'd like to ask you a couple of follow-up questions. So it's, it's easy to say, you know, we, we learned some lessons and, and, and we should do things differently. I'm wondering what those things are, right? Like, is, like the idea, for example, of a human rights, of, of a human rights impact statement, right? Or the, the, the specific ways that uh, McKinsey or another company would engage with local actors for. What, what, would be, what could be some imaginable protocols which don't now exist? Well, I think one, one is there's just some countries we're just not going to operate in because it's, we were talking about, so it's just too, cha it's, it's too challenging and, uh, and we are not sophisticated enough to handle it. So I think you just have to have some, you know, uh, you have to have a view of where you're going to operate or, or not. And the challenges in a firm, you get, you have people who, we hire people from around the world that want to work in the country they're, they're in. So if I just take, you know, Uzbekistan, is that, Country, I'm actually very positive about Uzbek, the developments in Uzbekistan and, and where it's moving, but it's got a lot of history. What's the timing by which you so you think about that? Maybe you, need, you know, and what's the process by which you get comfortable understanding what's going on? So I'm just saying that that's yeah. a, there's there's some process that's involved there. The second is when, when you do specific client selection. That's where we've got into some difficulty, and that's where that's a, we're a very private firm. And that's where I think in some places it would be good to get external perspective mm -hmm. as part of the process to say, is this client someone that we should work with given the leadership that's in place, given what we're actually trying to be, to, to be able, and we normally don't do that. And I, and I think getting, having a process in some places where you're getting feedback, and the thing is you have to have people you trust that understand right. what, 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 what you're doing and, and where you are. And that's a capability that we haven't had to have before, if, if you know what I mean, and where it is. And I think the other part is then, how do you deal when, when you do make mistakes and, and where you are and, and how, how you confront that, how you talk about that uh, internally? Um, 
how, how you allow people within the organization to have conversations about it. These, this is new territory. If I'm, I'm not being specific enough, but that's, these are some of the things. I think signing a declaration, that it sound, I, I don't, that we could do that. I think it's a coal face of a country and how people operate and the behaviors is what, what really matters. And then, mm -hmm. and then how do you evaluate? Are your evaluation processes you know, reinforcing that, or are they somehow encouraging that behavior? So you've got to look at that, that type of stuff. I think those processes are more important than declarations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I just add something to that yeah. real fast? Yeah, I, I would sort of say it goes both ways, too. Like, there have been so many, as you're talking, I'm thinking about times, particularly early on, and I, we're not as savvy as other human rights organizations about this, that we've gotten in trouble in, with our operations, and we didn't turn to gut business to help us either. We didn't sort of say, hey, do you know somebody, yeah. or can you sort of some of the big companies? Likewise, I mean, this is probably more sensitive, is you know, while we have insights into certain partners, you also have insights into partners. So it'd be interesting to see what that yeah. kind of conversation would be as well. Well, well you know, one other thing you, you triggered, I meant to say, is I, there's another element of where I think this shared space can really work. I'll just give you some examples that have worked and not worked. One, one area, I got very interested in Afghanistan. We're not gonna, open an office in Afghanistan. You're not involved, I'm not in, I'm you're not involved with McKinsey, you remember? No, no, yeah, sorry, I'm not, but, but I'm, I'm speaking from a former McKinsey person. It's not a place, it's not a priority market, let me put it that way. That doesn't mean you can't do something. So what we did there is with the British Army, um, we organized five CEOs of global companies to come in and say, could you think about investing in this country? Because part of the issue is unemployment of youth. That's a fundamental driver of why of, of how terrorism occurs. It's, not, it's, a, it's hunger and no jobs that go in. And so what we did was br bring five global companies to come in and meet the local business community and look for ways to invest. To, and, the, and the military was there because they, they, they know this will help with security. And then we had a, an NGO on the healthcare uh, side come in as well to, to look at this. And, that, and the view there was if we could start getting an investment cycle and jobs going, that might provide stability in terms of where things are going. We've, that didn't work, unfortunately, but in the sense that um, the, of the five, one in, invested, uh, but the scale, I, I picked the wrong, bringing a global multinational to uh, Kabul when, when the big product is jam in the, is not, it was not a very sophisticated way, you know, this is, but, but I think we could have thought about a different group of people to come in and, and, and do that. Where we have seen results is actually in northern Nigeria, and there's still a long way to go, again, where you've got a cycle of violence uh, going on. This is, again, where you know, I think mining companies play a very important role in, in doing this, financial services companies, the military and healthcare, to try and get stability in a, in a city. And that, so that's a, I don't, that's a, yeah. and, and in that, by the way, is where also from the, on the, on the media communication, just trying to think of the social infrastructure and that, that I think is a, so it's another yeah. dimension yeah. Of, of actually cool. trying to help build something. So Dominique, just, I, I, I'm going to disagree. Yeah. And I think yeah. when you say there's no value in making a statement or signing a declaration, it, by signing a declaration, you're ba basically identifying your company to the human rights community as someone yeah. who is human rights friendly. Right. And that opens an opportunity to be approached. And I think uh, that's quite important. Yeah. Well, can I just say, I didn't, I, what I, I'm gonna be very clear, I don't, I didn't mean not sign, what I'm yeah. saying is it, do that, but that's not enough, that's a minimum condition is yeah, all that's I'm saying. I, I'm saying it's easy to, it, fr frankly, it's easy to sign up to these things. I think it's, oh. how does that translate into, what I was saying, what are the behaviors you are gonna do to try and do that? And what are some of the dimensions where you don't have the capabilities to, you know what I mean? It's being clear. That, that's sorry. That's, I didn't want to come across as these statements. Yeah, no, okay. but, it, but it can be meaningful, Dominic, in a different way too, which is that it, uh, very often in, so when McKinsey's reported on, the response by um, Kevin Snyder or by you will be along the lines of, we wouldn't do something which opposes our values. And perhaps in the, like, the longer conversation with the journalist, it was clear what those values were. But in the newspaper article, one reads it and one says, all right, you wouldn't do something against your values, but we don't know what those are. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you sign a declaration, then there's text which says this is what we actually think, and that makes the conversation a lot clearer. And it also means that you, know, you can be held to account by yourself or by your employees. 
I, I think it's, it's, it's important um, to make sure that Debbie gets a, a, a last say here, and then um, JP, if you had anything you wanted to add, and then I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So. I think um, um, when we try to engage business or we encourage business to take a stand, some things, some regular excuses come up. In On Burma or Vietnam, where I was blacklisted and declared a threat to national security when I turned up to speak at the WEF ASEAN, um, and the, 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 the attitude is, um, okay, we, the default is we follow the national law, we abide by national law. Um, if we don't do it, someone else will, and we don't really have that power. Um, actually, business has a huge amount of power and a huge amount of influence. But if, if we take, substitute human rights defenders or human rights with, say, pedophilia, and you say, it's the national law to have pedophilia, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll live with that. Um, if we don't rape this child, someone else will. Um, uh, we feed the children, so it's okay for us to work, to partner with this pedophile. It sounds, of, of course, outrageous and unacceptable. So I think we, we need to also start thinking in, from that lens, because sometimes we say human rights without thinking about human beings. And when we talk about human rights impact assessment, we need gendered human rights impact assessment. We need to take into account indigenous people, people with disabilities. And, um, and, and we also need to understand that, and I wanna take, I really appreciate the fact that you were talking about the Friedman model, My, greed is good, profit for profit's sake. But in reality, the right of human rights defenders of affected communities of indigenous people, the environment, animals to go on living, transcends your right to make a killing. And that's basically what it boils down to. Otherwise, it's, this is not a sustainable space and it's not a sustainable planet. Can I just say something? One, one just comment though. I, I agree, agree with that. I'm saying I don't, I think that's not where business is. It's the notion of, that's what people are talking about. What's the purpose? You're there to solve a problem or, or uh, you know, help someone with something. And by the way, you make money from it in, in terms of where it is. But I, just as we talk about this, the other thing I just want to say, so a bit of reaction is, remember, we need business to invest as well, to create jobs. If business is not there, it's not, it's not gonna happen. It's just, so, so we need to also, while we're doing this, be careful that the, there is an ease of doing business. And obviously, what you're talking about on the, those are outrage, we just outrageous. wouldn't be there, we, we shouldn't do it. But I also just wanna get the balance in here that there's a, we also, there are many places where it's so complicated to, to get to do business, it won't happen. And that, that is devastating as well for the, so, so this is where I think we have to, sure. well, how do we work together to try and make that happen? Because if I just heard that, I just go, my, at some point you just go, okay, this is too hard. I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else and deal with it. I'm just giving you an emotional re you know, yeah. reaction. So that's what we just have to always keep in the balance is the, we need business to help create jobs and do it, but they have to do it in a ethically proper way. There's things they can, and it's in their interest to make sure that those systems are as strong as they can be. I just want to make sure that there's that. Does that? I think, I think Dominic, it goes, it goes back to your very important point about long-term and short-term because sometimes doing things that are uncomfortable in the short term are better in the long term, right? And that's, that's part of, I think, the shared space notion is that, yeah, I mean, what business really wants the reporters to write about how it's handling effluent or whatever. I mean, in the short term, what, which specific business really is gonna support a specific investigative journalism? Mm -hmm. But in the long run, and there's actually research behind this, in the long run, the environment for growth seems to be much stronger in situations where there is a strong media and where, the, where there's the rule of law. And so the individual temptation to say, you know, okay, this bothers me, is, is understandable. But then, I mean, the part of the shared space argument is that you make the space bigger by thinking in the long run and that the rights concept is a way of thinking over, over the long run. Uh, there's a promise that everyone has a chance to ask questions. So uh, especially those of you who um, are, are, are in the back and uh, are on the edge of your seats and I know when to ask questions, this is, this is your time. I'm looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at you too. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind, um, just identify yourself if, and, uh, and please formulate your question 
in the form of a question. Could. <laughs> Versus a statement. <laughs> and if you, yeah, and if you, if you want anyone in particular to answer it, or if there's a universal desire to hear more, you know, from Jean Pascal. Yes. Um, yeah. He's been very quiet. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, right? So. I yes. love, okay, I, I, sorry. No, I loved your, your analogy, by the way. I'll, I'll let you ask a question, but one thing is, it's fair to say that business, when they're going to invest in a country, they're going to look at whether or not it's safe, whether or not you can operate a country. So these are very easy countries, right? You don't go there, it's fine. And then they're very easy country. It's economically attractive, institution is super strong, therefore rule of law 100% applies. If you have a good business, you go there. And then you have a very large yeah. number of countries, okay? We all agree on that. Where business, the market is attractive, business is well regulated, there's some ease of doing business, there's some assumption that the rule of law does apply for business, and that's where you go. And the, the bulk of the question is how do you behave in these countries? What, what do you do exactly? And I am a strong believer, and I have five kids, and like I can tell you, I get grilled by them. They go from age 24 to 11, and you are attacked and everything. You get the whole, the whole thing, okay? Um, and I think you do great good by doing very ethically business in these countries, mm -hmm. by behaving yourself, not based on what you could do if you wanted to because the rule of the country applies it, but because of what, the, what you should do, the way you want to do it. And I think these are meaningful steps. Um, whether or not for the greater long term you should take uh, things and go and, and try to uh, overturn the, the, the regime and God does do somewhat to increase the share space. I'm not, in the I'm long not term, sure, maybe in the anyone. short term, I'm you not probably sure that's a direct quote. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not a direct quote. But I, I'm just arguing because I, th I love your pedophilia um, uh, argument. Let's be very clear. Um, well, in the short term, you're going to destroy the jobs, the good practice you bring to the country, the good services, and yes, you're going to destroy your investment. So cynics would say it's just forget about jobs and products. You're just focusing on your investment. Yeah, but okay, that's why we invest into the country too, and we think we can do both and profit and greater goods. Because I don't believe into profit for profit on the other. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to put that on the table because yeah. that's where the discussion is, okay? The, it's it's, easy, it's, it's yeah. easy for the, some countries is super easy and other countries is super easy. That's where this gray zone of mm -hmm. real life and how do you deal with it? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, no, and are we always as courageous as we should? Okay, that is not a question, it's a statement. No, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed now by the mental picture of you on the barricades. Which is what <laughs> yes, what come to our away. side, come on, come on. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I'm not sure it's gonna help the, uh, the yeah. Schmilby going forward. But I think, I mean, so, right, I, I agree with you, but the, one of the things about this shared space idea is that it's meant to suggest possibilities for actions which are not risky for anybody, yeah. Yeah. and which may actually hold off risk. So, for example, a protocol where you don't think about it, you just have the protocol that you engage local journalists mm. or you try to engage local journalists, mm. right? Maybe you help local journalists while you're doing it, but you, might, you learn some things which might head off certain problems which international journalists will later find out about, right? Like little things like that don't involve any risk. They actually reduce risk, mm. but we might not think of them unless we have the protocol. Okay, this gentleman's been very patient. Hi, my name is Carl Hagman. I, I run a shipping company and Amongst other things, we have 35,000 Burmese and Filipino seafarers. My question is, is more, is this a question of morality or courage? Isn't it more a question of self-interest? And this is the first time I'm in Davos, and I've been hardwired, and I've come to where I am, because I've delivered quarterly results and, and, and a good company, but we are the super winners of globalization, and, and the liberal economies and, and Declaration of Human Rights have served us extraordinarily well. So, I mean, we have more to lose than anybody else of not upholding the system. Shouldn't the whole argument be out of our self-interest, the super winners of globalization, that we should be doing this as a, not from a moral point of view, but from a structural point of view? And shouldn't this really be a core of a Davos converse, of all Davos conversations? I, 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 we're trying to, we're trying to have it both ways here. Mm. <laughs> We're trying to have it both ways. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to explain this shared space idea, which is out there, and it includes both parts, right? I mean, there's the notion that collectively it's the interest of business to have the shared space, that there may be an individual business argument having to do with reputation and having to do with risk, but also there is this thing which you're calling ethics, i.e., we have profited from this world, what kind of world do we want to live in? I was trying to get at that a little bit, a little bit jokingly with the notion of free riders, mm. because business, of course, does free ride uh, on 
the rule of law, right? But business doesn't necessarily create the rule of law, and there are some people who take personal risks for that. That's where we're starting from. And my point was that this was not out of out of ethics, it's out of self-interest. Self yeah. I mean, we are the ones that are winning off of the system, so I think but, but, the okay, notion of free riders is right. wonderful. Yeah, we're trying to have it both ways. I mean, if you, if you want it to be self-interest, I'll agree with you. If you want to be morality, I'll agree with you too. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, I'm, I don't mean to hold off the I say one, one thing that you triggered. I mean, I, that's what I mean by, I think it's, the, it's what's the company's purpose, right? And I think you, it is in the cell. You, I don't believe there's a difference between shareholder and stakeholder. They, the two go together. You can't have great shareholder returns if you don't have great stakeholder. It's a, it, there's evidence, very clear evidence uh, of that, and you obviously operate that way. But I think one, one country, I was triggered by this, I was just in Chile a couple of weeks ago and the, the major business council in Chile had their entire session around the purpose of the corporation and, a, and how they deal, deal with corruption, um, what, how they deal with the environment, are they accounting, what are, the, are we measuring things properly? A lot of businesses focus on financial reporting and not the non-financial reporting, natural capital, the human capital, the trust in the, in the system. And what I think was interesting there, I'm just saying, I, I just happened to go there to speak it. This is self-organized, the government didn't tell them to do it, but to actually say, what can we do to do a better job and set the standards? Maybe the only thing that was missing was it was all business people. It would have been good to have others in the, in, in the community. But I, I think you're seeing more of that now where people are saying this is, and it's not because the Chilean system's broken. You know what I mean? They've had, like other companies, we've had the challenges, but they, the notion is it's important for us to strengthen it. And let's all do it together and have a common set of standards, and it's large companies and small companies, and those are, I think, those are encouraging signs. The, the, the hard-edged answer to your question is that even though it might be in the interest of businesses in general to preserve a liberal world order, you can always find a business who will find it in its particular interest yes to help an authoritarian regime oppress its citizens, right? And that will be perfectly rational from a perfectly means ends point of view for that particular business. And that has to be part of the conversation that we're having. I think, Carl, I, I really appreciate your comment and I'm glad that people, that business people like you in the world, and yes, um, sometimes when we say, you know, it's in your interest, Trying to make the business argument for human rights is actually quite interesting because there's always going to be people who resist or there will be people who say we like human rights until it threatens our profit margin and then suddenly the human rights commitments go out the window. But I think, and, and, and so it's just like saying I, I insist on being an atheist until I have proof that I can go to heaven. Um, and <laughs> I want to be an atheist, but then I want to go to heaven. Very broad in your example. Um, <laughs> uh, but but the, 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 the reality is that all of us at some stage are going to have to decide in order to be sustainable and to be part of this world that we might have to actually take a hit on the profits. We, I mean, maybe make, make you know, a few billion dollars less, but not kill the business. I think that's important, but also, in the shared space too, we have a huge threat, which is the slap suits, the strategic litigation to prevent public participation. And these are judicial harassments against local communities and against human rights defenders who are actually trying to address problems caused by um, business activities or business activities happening in a repressive situation. And so that's one, please don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's another element to this which I'm just gonna close on, which is v valorizing the human rights defenders so that th these are individual human beings who are taking risks and uh, journalists or people trying to defend human rights, especially in certain parts of the world, are simply facing risks that most of us are not faced. And they may be doing something which is good in itself. They may also be doing something which others wouldn't be willing to do to defend the larger project of the rule of law. The notion of the shared space valorizes the business person who is doing something, but it also valorizes the, the human rights defender, and it tries, to make the, it tries to make the case that those people have something that they can talk about. I hope that this seminar has confirmed rather than negated that general proposition. I wanna thank all of you for coming together and, and, and uh, all of you for coming to listen. And I hope that this notion has a future. Thank you very much. Thank you.